Well, good morning. Check one, two, three, one, We two, do this two. every week. Good morning. That's much better. Come on, let's stand and sing a little bit. dry drink of the water come and thirst no more come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for seated. Boy, y'all sound lovely today. If you're happy to be in the Lord's house this morning, say amen. amen. Praise God. We're so glad that you're here. If you're our guest today, we want to welcome you to Central Baptist Church. We are absolutely honored that you've chosen Central today to come and worship, and we ask you to do us a small favor. In the seat back in front of you, you'll see a card. It looks just like this. It's called a Connect card. 
do me a favor, take that card out. You can fill it out now or you can wait till the end of service, however you want. But at the conclusion of today's service, out in the lobby to the left, there's a table called the CBC Connect table. If you would stop by that table and just take that card to the person that's standing there, uh, you give them the card, they're gonna give you a guest bag. It's got a few goodies in it as a gift from us. It's got some sweets, but it's also got some information about our Bible studies. We would love the opportunity to connect with you and share with you some of the great things that God is doing here at Central. So please, please drop that off and pick up that bag. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. They're there to help and answer any questions that they can. Also, I've got a few announcements that I want to share with you. Next Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. right here in front of the church, our youth is going to be having their car wash, which is to help them raise money for camp. If you've not bought a ticket yet, that is okay. You can come next Saturday to the car wash between the hours of 9 and 1. Just show up. You if you have a ticket, you show up with your ticket, you won't pay. But if you don't have a ticket, you can just show up and pay at the time because the kids need your help. This is how we reduce the cost of camp. When I was a teenager, camp was like 50 bucks. Yeah, I'm that old. It was a long time ago. But now it's like almost $400 or it is $400. It's a lot of money. But uh, Every year at this church, we have fundraisers, give all of our kids, even the kids camp, the teen camp, give them the opportunity to make that camp cost go sometimes down to nothing. Like last year, one young man uh, raised enough to where he paid for his camp and he almost paid for someone else's too. So that's great. We've never told a kid they can't go to camp because we've been blessed with people in our church that always will help those who cannot afford it. So uh, either way, we just would appreciate if you need a car wash, come get it washed. If you don't need a car wash, but you want to help, come give them some money either way. All right. That's the car wash next Saturday. Um, next Sunday. How many of you know what next Sunday is? It's Easter Sunday. Every Sunday here at Central, we celebrate Easter Sunday because every Sunday we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not something we do once a year. It's something that we do every day of our lives, but especially in particularly on the Lord's Day on Sundays. That's what we're here today to celebrate. So we're asking you to do us a huge favor. And every table out there in the lobby, I've got stacks of these cards. You don't have to take a whole stack. If you want a whole stack and you'll use a whole stack, then take a whole stack. But take as many as you'd like. Um, what we're asking you to do is to take these invites with you. It's just a simple invite. This week is the easiest week of the year to invite someone to church. You know why? Because a lot of people uh, who don't ever darken the door of a church do think about going to church on Easter Sunday. So this is an easy week to invite someone and to bring someone with you. So take some of those cards and use them this week to invite people. Because I'll be honest with you, as I go out into the lobby today after you're all gone and I look and see those cards sitting there on the table, they become scrap paper because next Sunday is Easter. So please, let's eliminate those cards and let's take them out and put them in the hands of people so the Lord can use it to try to draw them into this place and hear the most wonderful message that mankind has ever heard. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So please help us out with that. Our vacation Bible school this summer is going to be July the 10th to the 14th. And the good news to all the people who always said, you know, it's during the day and I have to work, I would come help. We're going to have it in the evening. So you can come help. But so we're asking you to do us a huge favor. Go to the website, CBC. Those are the initials for Central Baptist Church, cbc.live. Click the sign up tab on the home page. It'll take you to a list of things you can sign up for. And right there, sign up to volunteer for VBS because we need, the, we need to know we've got the help because we're starting the work now. VBS doesn't just start the week before, it starts now. So we, my wife and Jasmine and Allison have already had several meetings and they're working on it. So we need some helpers to get signed up. And then while you're on the cbc.live website and you're on the sign up tab, Ladies, this is to you. On Saturday, May the 13th at 8 a.m., we're going to have a mother-daughter breakfast. We used to have these years ago over at the uh, Falcon Point Country Club, and it was about $20 or $25 a person. And it was white tablecloth. It was kind of fancy. We're not going to be so fancy, but it will be decorated. It will be nice. It's going to be a fun time, but there's no charge. So if you're a lady, you're either a daughter or you're a mother 
or you could be both. We want all of our ladies to sign up and come to the mother-daughter breakfast on Saturday, May the 13th at 8 a.m. Do us a huge favor though, we need to know how many to cook for. So go to cbc.live, click sign up, go to the mother-daughter breakfast and get signed up. It's gonna be a great, great fun time that day, ladies, and we want you all to be here. I think that concludes my announcement. Some of you are going, thank goodness. I wish he would just be quiet already. Well, guess what? I'm coming back in about 10 minutes and I got some more stuff that I want to say to you. Hey, you know what? I think back about the life of Jesus and you remember the time that Jesus Christ went into the temple and he got angry when he saw the money changers, the people using the house of God as a place to make profits and it irritated him. And what did he do? He went in there and he overturned their tables and he drove them out and he said, You guys are a bunch of thieves. You've turned my father's house into a den of thieves when the Lord said, it's a house of prayer. Aren't you glad that this is his house and it's a house of prayer? Here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna pray right now. And if you would, as you bow your heads and close your eyes, would you do me a favor? Would you pray within your own heart this morning that the Holy Spirit of God would so move in this service that he would touch your heart and the heart of every person who's here and every person who's watching online. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for who you are. God, we praise you. We thank you. We exalt you. Lord, we are in awe that you love us the way that you do. And Lord, we just want to say thank you. Lord, I pray right now there's sin in any of our hearts, bitterness, unforgiveness, whatever it is, Lord, I pray right now in this moment that your spirit would Reveal that to us. And Lord, in the quietness of our heart, we would get it settled with you. Lord, cleanse us, purify us. And Lord, as we continue to worship together in song this morning, I pray that we would lift our hearts and our voices to you in praise because God, you are worthy of every ounce of praise we could offer to you. And Lord, I pray in a few moments when I come back to preach your word, God, I pray, Lord, that your word would go out into the heart of every person who hears it and that it would do what only it can do. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's all stand together and let's continue in worship together this morning. love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses the one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same thing for me, for me, for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness and your faithfulness. I'm calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the Lord. All things are possible I'm calling on the God of David Who made a shepherd boy courageous I may not face Goliath But I've got my own giant Oh 
Is that me making all that noise? I might have to bend this thing out from my cheek just a hair. Let's try this. I don't want to battle it all more. How's that? All right. All right. Have your Bibles this morning. We're going to be in Luke 19. In fact, let me just ask you this. If you have your Bibles this morning and you brought it with you, just, just hold it up for a second. Hold it up. All right. I bet that's a beautiful sight to heaven right there when God looks down and sees his word being lifted up. Let me tell you something. While you're turning to Luke 19, you go ahead and turn there, tell you something about this book. I was just having this thought. I can remember when I was a teenager and my youth pastor would tell us, are you listening teens? I'm talking to you also right now. My youth pastor would tell us back then, he said, listen, if you're going out on a date and you want to make sure the date stays right, he said, just do this one little thing. It works every time. He said, take your Bible with you and set it on the seat in the car between the two of you. He said, it is a shield that will protect you. And he said it to the young lady. He said, and he probably won't bring it. So you take it. And when you get in, you just set it there as a message to him. You know, people chuckle. But let me tell you something. The Bible itself says that this book, it is powerful, it is quick, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. The Word of God is powerful. Uh, let me just encourage all of you. How many of you this week maybe were out at some point, something you were doing, maybe you were out working, maybe you were out 
going out for fun, but something came up and you just found yourself in a tempting situation and it was tough to fight against the temptation. How many of you would be honest and say, yeah, I had a couple of those instances this past week. Let me tell you something, arm yourself. The Bible says, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, part of that armor is the word of God. You should be reading God's word every day. You should be praying every day. You should be trying to commit scripture to memory so that you will have it up here. But let me tell you something else. Get you a little one. I've got some. I, I, they're, they're little and they're the whole Bible. Now the print's really small, but in a pinch, I can read it. I'll take my glasses off and kind of zoom it out so I can get the words big enough. If you want to know what it says, you'll find a way to read it. Maybe you have it on your phone. Most of you do. How many of you got the Bible on your phone? Yeah. Well, I know you always have your phone with you. When that situation arises, do yourself a favor. Before you act and give in to the temptation that you think that you're struggling and can't stand against, you open up to the word of God and begin to read God's word. Whether it's a Psalm, whether it's something in the New Testament, one of the gospels, maybe one of the letters that the apostle Paul wrote to the churches, you just turn to God's word. I'm telling you, you will make the discovery that it is quick, that it is powerful, and that it is sharper than any two-edged sword. God's word is powerful, and I think many times the reason that as Christians, we're not demonstrating the power that we're supposed to as Christians is because we're not fully grounded in God's word. Amen. I've been in this series for the last maybe six weeks on prayer. And I told you we're going to take a little break from it today and next Sunday. But then the week after Easter, we're coming back to a message that has been burning in my heart for some time. So I pray right now that you will make plans to be here on that Sunday and that you will try to bring someone with you. I want to show you not only that there's power in prayer as individual children of God, but there is great power in prayer when children of God come together united with a common thing that they're praying for. And I think every one of you here would like to see a move of the Holy Spirit and a move of God in this church as we try to reach this community with the gospel. If that's you this morning, would you just say amen? Yeah, we want to. And I, I think that I have a message that will help challenge us and inspire us. So if you have your Bibles or you have your device and you're open to Luke 19, would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word this morning? Today is a special day. Today is what we call Palm Sunday. In my Bible right here at the top of this passage, it says the triumphal entry. Now that's not the triumphal entry parts, not the the Bible. It's just they're labeling what this section that we're about to read is. Um, and I thought about it. What do I want to speak on Good Friday? I've, I'm not Good Friday, but on Palm Sunday, I've spoke on this day many times. And so um, I thought, man, how do I write another message on Palm Sunday? I thought maybe I should just go back and do one of my other ones. But then I was sitting there early Monday morning, having some thoughts about it. And I thought, you know, Jesus had done some incredible, amazing things. He had an amazing life. I mean, you, Christian or not, you want to study an amazing life? Study the life of Christ. He had an amazing life. And uh, his life was one of such contrasts. And so I titled today's message, From Famous to Infamous. And you're going to see it happen in five days. Let's go to the passage, verse 29. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever set. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near 
to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I love this, watch this. Jesus said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And God, we're so humbled by the way that you love us, the way that you've blessed us. And God, my prayer today is that your word would go out into all of our hearts, that we would receive it, that we would hear it, that we would apply it, that we would allow it to shape and to mold our lives so that our lives would be the sweet smelling savor to you, Lord, that you desire them to be. I pray, God, today that your spirit would speak into our hearts. And I ask, Lord, that in my weakness, God, you would be made strong and we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Like I've already said, the life of Jesus is the most interesting of all lives. He, he lived a life of such contrast. We know that he was born in Bethlehem as the Old Testament prophets prophesied that he would. We know that he was born of a virgin as the Old Testament prophets said that he would. And then honestly, after the Magi came and gave gifts to him and worshiped him, we don't really know anything else about his life until we know about 12 years old, they had gone into Jerusalem and then on their way back, they looked around Mary and Joseph and discovered that Jesus, their son, their 12 year old boy wasn't with the crowd. Where is he? So they, they scurry back to Jerusalem and they find Jesus standing on the steps of the temple, expounding at 12 years old on the scriptures to the scribes and the Pharisees and the people are blown away at the knowledge that this 12 year old boy has about the word of God. And then from there, we don't really know anything else about his upbringing and his life until he's 30 years old when he begins his earthly ministry. And so we're going to kind of focus our attention. Most of the New Testament is focused on the, uh, most of the gospels are spoke, focused on this part of his life, this last three and a half years. Jesus began his ministry at the age of 30. And when his ministry began, he worked mostly in obscurity. What I mean by that, nobody knew who he was. And verse two, the truth is, nobody really cared who he was either. Most people saw him as a young man who came from a town who was considered, the town that he was from, was considered to be the armpit of Israel. I mean, it was like, you'll hear it sometimes in scripture. They'll say, nothing good can come out of Nazareth. Well, I got news for you. The greatest thing ever came out of Nazareth and his name is Jesus. But when it started, nobody really cared. Nobody was interested. Uh, in fact, like I said, there's times in scripture where we'll find him even referred to as the son of a carpenter. And, and, or the carpenter boy. And it's meant to be kind of like an insult, like demeaning, like he, he's, he's not anyone of influence. He's not anyone of power. He, his family doesn't have any authority. He doesn't have this great heritage. So that's how his ministry began. But watch this. Things began to rapidly change. Jesus started doing the ministry. He started healing people. He was causing Blinded eyes that had never seen. Not someone that went blind and then for a few years and then he healed them. No, there was one time, remember where he healed a blind man and his disciples said, why was this man born blind? Was it his sin or was it his parents' sin? And Jesus said, it wasn't because of anyone's sin. It was so that the, glor the father could be glorified in the son. He healed blinded eyes. He caused deaf ears that had never heard to hear. He, he caused the lame to rise up and walk. He caused leprosy to depart people's body and for them to be made whole. He was casting out demons from demon-possessed people. I think of the maniac at Gadara who was living in a cemetery, stripping himself naked, running around, screaming, cutting himself with stones, and, and just 
totally terrifying the people. It actually made me think a couple weeks ago, my wife and I convinced her to go to Bass Pro with me to buy a few fishing lures. I got the one she wanted. But anyways, so we're walking out of Bass Pro. It's, the mall is closed. You know, they, I stayed till they shut down. We're walking out down there by that new part where they have the bulldozers and the little tractors that people can go play on. And off in the distance, she'll remember, we hear this guy, I mean, screaming at the top of his lungs. I mean, you can't even make out what the man's saying. He's screaming, and it, it, it occurred to me very quickly that this man was troubled. And at first I thought, well, maybe he's got mental and emotional problems, perhaps. But you know what? After I thought about it for a second, I thought, he sounds possessed. You know, people were possessed by demons back in Bible days. Did you know that there are still people in our world today who are possessed by demons? The, the evil powers that we fight against are still very real and active in our lives every day on this earth. So I hear this guy off screaming and it made me think about the maniac at Gadara. But you know what? Jesus Christ spoke a word to this man and the legion of demons was cast out of him and the man was made whole. He clothed himself, he acted calm and he was a changed man for the rest of his life. You see, in the Jesus started doing these things. He started healing, casting out demons. You know what else he did? He brought dead people back to life. And as news began to spread about the things that Jesus was doing, it got to a point that everywhere that he went, he was being followed by great crowds of people. And, and people who had only heard about him would do just about anything to catch a glimpse of him. In fact, in Luke 19, if you go to verse one, you'll be, read about a little guy named Zacchaeus. It says that he was a, uh, a, a chief publican. He was like the head of the tax collectors. He was one of the tax collectors. He was Jewish, but he was one of the tax collectors that worked for the Roman government that was ruling over Jerusalem at the time. And, and he was... Uh, he wasn't a great guy. He was powerful, he was rich, but he wasn't a great guy. He was charging his own people above that which they were supposed to pay to pad his own pocket. But even he had heard about the things that Jesus was doing and he wanted to see him so much. When Jesus had come into his town, it says that he ran ahead because he was small in stature, nothing against the short people. This man was just wise. He ran ahead, he found a tree, and he climbed up in it. He humbled himself, folks, so that he could catch a glimpse of Jesus. This is how popular and how the fame of Jesus had gone out, that even a rich, crooked tax collector was willing to humble himself and climb up into a tree so he could catch a glimpse of this Jesus that he had heard so much about. You see, people all during that time were drawn to Jesus for many different reasons. We know that many were drawn to him because they had heard about the many miracles that he performed. And let's be honest, a lot of the people that were drawn to him were drawn to him because they themselves needed a miracle in their own lives. I'm sure others were drawn to him simply for the spectacle. I mean, think about it. If you had heard about this and, and you were fine, you were healthy, your, your financial needs were met, you didn't really need anything, wouldn't you at least want to see it happen? Wouldn't you want to see someone who you knew had been blind their whole life suddenly be able to see? Some of the people just came to see the miracle happen. And there were surely many who came to hear him preach or to hear him teach. You see, his message was very unique. It was unlike any of the other uh, people who were teaching God's word. Jesus' message was unique. You'll, in fact, you'll hear it said of him in the Bible. You'll hear people say that this man spoke as one having authority. You see, he didn't just teach as someone who had studied the scriptures. He spoke as someone having authority. Now, why is that? We know why. It was his word. He did have the authority. We know many times people in the crowd around him weren't just people there for a miracle, weren't just people there to see a miracle, weren't just people there because they were intrigued by his teaching. There were other people in the crowd many times that had a much different motive. You see, there were some people there following Jesus because Jesus angered them. He ticked them off. They didn't like the things that he was saying. They didn't like the things that he was doing. In fact, they were there seeking, trying to find something that like aha moment so they could trap him and pin him down and take him before the religious 
authorities. There were people there because they hated him and they hated the work and the message that he was sharing. By the second year of his ministry, the crowds were growing in leaps and bounds. In fact, so much so that one day he's teaching on a hillside and the Bible tells us about it. And it says that there were 5,000 men, we usually leave this off, but plus women and children. I'm telling you folks, there was 20,000 plus people there. I mean, they had more children back then than we do now, right? They had a lot more children, but anyways, 5,000. And Jesus says, they came to him and said, Master, the people are hungry. We need to send them home. Let them go. Jesus said, well, what do we have? They said, well, we can't afford to feed them. And he said, what do we have? He said, one small lad has two little fillets of fish and five pieces of bread. Jesus said, bring it to me. Jesus blessed it and he broke it up, delivered it out to his disciples. And his disciples fed everyone in the crowd, the 5,000 men, plus the women, plus the children. And when he was done, there was 12 baskets of fragments left over. Jesus Christ. Let me just, there's so many messages here that I'd like to take, but my time's going and the talk, clock is ticking. Um, Jesus can take very little and he can do more than you ever imagine. Don't ever let me hear you say, well, I would serve, but I just don't have anything to offer. That is an insult to God. God made you, he created you, and he has given you something to do. And every one of us, if we'll surrender ourselves to him, he will use our little to do great things. We just need to put it in his hands. But by the second year, Jesus has done all these things. These crowds are following him everywhere he goes. There are throngs and throngs of people. In fact, many times you'll find he would just slip away from the crowd every now and then to get alone with the father to pray because he was exhausted. But then all of a sudden something happened. Listen carefully, church. Jesus began to this crowd to teach a message of extreme commitment as found in John chapter six, verses 48 through 71. Uh, for the sake of time, I won't read all those, but also like Luke chapter nine, verses 23 and 24, which says, then he said to them all, the crowd's there listening to him speak. And he says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. It was at this point in his ministry that his so-called disciples, many of them, turned and headed back home. You see, the people didn't want to hear about a cross. They knew what a cross was for. It was an instrument used by the Roman government for capital punishment. They're like, wait, 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 wait. what are you talking about a cross? Then they, they didn't want to hear about dying to themselves. Uh, they, they were like, you know what? Maybe this following Jesus isn't all that I thought it was. They didn't want to hear about losing their life so that they can find it. In John 6, as Jesus, Jesus is giving this message of extreme commitment in John chapter six in verse 66, it says this, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. By the time Jesus was coming to the end of his three and a half year ministry, most of the people who were still following them, not all of them, but most of them were people who were committed in their hearts to following after Jesus. Yes, there were still those who were following him simply for the sake of trying to bring him down. Isn't that something? You know, times haven't changed. Here we are 2,000 years later. You let someone do real good. They're having great success. And it just seems like there's always a crowd of people who want to see them crumble and come down. It wasn't any different then. There were people who were following Jesus, just waiting, just watching, just hoping for his demise. Many people in that crowd were not fond of the things that Jesus said and Jesus did. We must remember there were those who were following after Jesus and they were adamantly and vehemently opposed to his message and to his life. And they were seeking an opportunity to rid this world of this man named Jesus. Jesus, even amongst his own disciples, his closest group, you know, the 12, even among them, there was Judas Iscariot who would soon be the one to betray the Lord Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. 
Church, listen to me this morning. It's important for us to remember that the crowd is often very flaky. I say, young people, please hear me. Teenagers, but not just them. Adults too. We all need to remember that we are, should be very careful uh, about allowing the crowd to put peer pressure on us, peer pressure on us, or trying to make us feel like we need to go with the crowd. Guys, we must make up our minds now that no matter what opposition comes our way, that we are going to stand for Christ, we are going to stand for his kingdom, even when there are very few who are willing to walk with us down that narrow path. Let me even go a step further. If there's nobody willing to go with you to follow after Jesus, then you keep your eyes on him and you go at it alone. Our text today picks up on the Sunday before Jesus is going to be crucified on a cross for the sin of the whole world. In these verses, we see that as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, he again was being held as a hero. His committed followers were there, and I'm sure many other well-wishers had showed up as well. But even among the, among the committed followers and those who now were hoping that Jesus was finally going to come into town and do what they thought in their hearts the promised Messiah would do, that I'm sure among them, all that crowd, there were still those haters who were there waiting for that gotcha moment on Jesus. You see, a lot of the people wanted their Messiah you ever wanted God to do something in your life and you had a preconceived idea of what and how he should do it? See a few of you nodding. Thank you for your honesty. If you're a Christian, every one of us at some point in our lives have had a need in our life and we had a preconceived idea of what and how God should do what we need done. Well, the Jews were no different. They knew, they knew for thousands of years that their Messiah would come. Ever since man sinned in the garden, God kept reminding his people, I'm going to send one. I'm going to send one. He's going to crush the head of Satan. And they had an idea of what they wanted their promised Messiah to be like. And here's where they were at. Rome was ruling over them. So their idea of a Messiah was one who would come into Rome, to Jerusalem and run Rome out and take up the throne and rule and reign from that point forward. They wanted Christ Jesus to take the throne, but that's not what he came for. He came for a much greater purpose than that. And that was to set every generation that had already been lived and died all those who were presently living and all those who would ever live. He came to set all generations free from the bondage and the penalty of sin. I've always found this last week of Christ's life to be most interesting. He rides into town on the back of a young donkey that's never been ridden, just as the prophet Zechariah said he would. Hundreds of years before, in Zechariah 9.9, 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Not only, listen church, did Jesus fulfill that prophecy, but up to this point in his life, as he's riding into Jerusalem, he had fulfilled every single prophecy concerning the Messiah apart from the ones that were going to be fulfilled during this last week of his life. I mean, for those who studied the scriptures and studied the prophecies, they should have known that Jesus was the promised one. Us, we have the whole entire revelation. People in this world today with God's word should know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah that Jesus Christ is the precious lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. That is the message that the church has. That's the message that we believe. But yet many times in our daily lives, we are silent on the issue. Why is that? What are we afraid of? It's the truth. It's the living word of God. As I said a moment ago, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. If you're out there trying to do battle 
for the kingdom with your own words, that's why you're having trouble. But if you equip yourself with God's word and you share God's word and you allow the spirit of God to work through you using his word, you'll be amazed what God will accomplish. We have tremendous knowledge because we have hindsight. We can look back. But Jesus Christ fulfilled every prophecy that they had. In spite of all that Jesus was, in spite of all that he had done, in spite of all the obvious signs and wonders, so many people still rejected and mocked him. But what is so very sad is that all these people who've gathered together to welcome Messiah into town, watch this, these people who are laying down their clothes and laying down palm branches, these people who are shouting and hailing him as Messiah, the son of David, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, these very same people are the same ones who in five days will be calling for his death on the cross. Not every one of them, but the vast majority. Guys, let me tell you something about the crowd. They ended up getting it wrong this day. And not much has changed these 2,000 years later. For the most part, I can tell you, and I've said it to my parents growing up, you know, let me do this, let me do that. Everyone is doing it. I'll tell you, if everyone's doing it, that's probably your first indication that you shouldn't. Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. There's not going to be a lot of people doing what Christ wants them to do. The people shouted with praise as the Messiah of the world rode into town. You see, they had an expectation of what he's going to do when he got there. But they were just like we often are. They were sorely disappointed. Church, listen to me. Just because someone says they believe in Jesus as the Messiah, that does not mean that they've been truly saved. There are many who enjoy the miracles. There are many who like the message. But so many miss the fact that salvation does not come through anything else but a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus was speaking of the day of judgment in Matthew chapter 7. And to me, these are some of the saddest words I ever read in Scripture. Beginning in verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? Have we not preached in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders, wonderful works in your name? Preachers, Sunday school teachers, people who are on fire and out there sharing the gospel. These are the people that Jesus, some of the people that Jesus is speaking about. Listen what he says to them after they give this reply. Of course, he's speaking of future judgment events. But then he says, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Just because someone says they believe in Jesus does not mean that they have given their life to Jesus Christ. Guys, it has always amazed me that on the Sunday before Jesus was the Savior that they'd been waiting so long for, but within just a few days, their opinion of him had changed so much. The rapid change of opinion came because they thought Jesus to be nothing more than an imposter. At that point, they were convinced he was a fake. In other words, he was not the Messiah that they had hoped for. He was not the one he had imagined. And because he was not what they wanted, the best thing to do was just kill him. The religious leaders of his day, they absolutely hated Jesus. You ever wondered why? Why did they despise Christ so much? Well, first of all, because he didn't cower to them. You see, these men were full of themselves. They were prideful. They were arrogant. And they wanted Jesus to bow down and kiss their feet just like everyone else did. Jesus didn't do that. These men, uh, in fact, you can read about 
Listen to Jesus as he addresses them in Matthew chapter 23, beginning in verse 25. Now, keep in mind, this is Jesus talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, the chief priests. He's talking to the big wigs. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You ever called someone a hypocrite to their face? I, I haven't. I've done it jokingly, like, oh, don't be such a hypocrite. <laughs> where I kind of mean it, but you know, I'm just not quite brave enough to just say it. Well, Jesus just said it. He laid it out there. Woe to you, you bunch of hypocrites. He said, you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish. You make yourself look very spiritual, but on the inside, you're full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish that the outside of them may be clean also. Jesus says, you don't start the cleansing by making the outside look good. You start by getting on your knees with the Father and cleaning up the inside and then it will work its way out and the outside will look good. Oh, these guys were terrible, but you know what? They're just like so many people today. He said, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? In just a few days, Jesus goes from being the most famous man in all of Israel to being the most infamous, hated man in all of Israel. When Jesus was tried by Pilate, the Roman governor, who some people try to make out as a compassionate guy. This guy wasn't compassionate. You know what Pilate was? I'm not being ugly. There, there's some politicians out there that I like and admire, but Pilate was just a slimy politician who just wanted to keep the approval of the people so he could maintain and keep his position of power. That's all, that's all he was. He wasn't compassionate as some people want to make him out to be. He was just trying to protect, protect his power. In this trial of Jesus, he was just attempting to make all parties happy. He had the religious leaders over here saying, you know what? He's a blasphemer. We need to kill him. The law says we can kill him. Let's kill him. They were tired of trying to always debate what Jesus said. They said the best thing we could do is just get rid of him. Gone forever. Done with him. Let's kill him. Pilate's like, well, you know, I've examined him. Examined him. I've asked him questions. And I, I can't find anything of fault in the guy. I mean, he, they said, he claims to be the son of God. So he says to Jesus, are you the Christ? And Jesus said, you say that I am. <laughs> His wife came to him. She said, honey, Pilate, don't, don't have anything to do with the death of this just man. I had a dream. I've... You know, just please, just don't partake in, in this, anything to do with this guy. So now Pilate's, he's got the, the, the Jewish religious leaders that if he doesn't make them happy, they're going to write back to Rome and say, we need a new leader. This guy is spineless. He's trying to keep his Roman soldiers happy who are hungry for some blood. And now he's trying to keep his wife happy who's saying, have nothing to do with the death of this guy. Please, honey, I've, I've had a dream and there's just something that we don't need to be involved in this. So Pilate says, I know what I'll do. He said he knew enough. He'd been there long enough. He knew the custom of the Jewish people was at time of Passover that you let a prisoner go. So in his mind, he was a smart politician. He thought, I'll get the worst piece of garbage in our prison and I'll offer them to either have Jesus or have that prisoner released. And he, in his mind, he's saying, it's all Jesus is guilty of is claiming to be something they don't believe that he is. So surely, surely, 
they'll choose Jesus. And that prisoner's name was Barabbas. He was a murderer. He was, I mean, this guy was the lowest of the low. So Pilate says, hey, I got an idea. At time of Passover, you let a prisoner go. How about um, I offer to you uh, Barabbas or Jesus? Who would you like to see let go? And the the crowd shouts, give us Barabbas. And he says, what should I do with Jesus? And they said, crucify him. Crucify him. Some of the same people that five days earlier were laying down palm branches shouting Hosanna in the highest are now calling crucify him. The religious leaders and the people, they told Pilate, give us the worst criminal who's in prison. They just wanted Jesus dead. Even Listen, even if it meant letting this most vile criminal back on the streets of Jerusalem. You say, Pastor Roy, what's, what's the point? Well, first, I want you to notice how fast Jesus can go from seeming like he means something in someone's life to meaning nothing. Some of us right now are hearing this message thinking, okay, I know the Spirit of God speaking. Not me, the Spirit. And you're thinking, I know what I'm going to do when I leave this building. I know who I'm going to call. I know who I'm going to witness to. And you know what? A lot of us are going to walk out this building and five minutes later not give another single thought to what the Spirit has said to us in these 30 minutes. You see, we can go to from one feeling in our heart to change so rapidly, so dramatically, so quickly. You say, what's the point? Here's the real point. Jesus was on trial before Pilate. Pilate found no fault in him, sent him over to Herod. Herod found no fault in him, sent him back to Pilate. Pilate realized his position as governor was threatened, so he gave the people what they wanted, and he thought he could cleanse himself by saying, you guys take him and crucify him. I'll wash my hands of the blood of this man. But let me tell you something. Every one of our blood was on him. Every single one of us. You're like, I wasn't there, Pastor. No, you weren't, but your sin was present. Because Jesus became sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. Here's the the point of today's message. Jesus Christ is still on trial today. He's not standing before Pilate. He's not standing before a Jewish court. He's not standing before the U.S. Supreme Court. But let me tell you where he's standing on trial today. He's on trial in your own heart. He's on trial in every one of our hearts today. And guys, I'll tell you this. We can't have it both ways. Jesus said, you're either with me or you're against me. That was Jesus who said that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. He said, he who is not with me is against me. You know what that means? You can't be neutral. When the name Jesus comes up, you can't say, oh, I just kind of take neutral ground there. I'm riding the fence. There's no fence with Jesus. You're either with him or Jesus said you're against him. If you've not yielded yourself to the lordship of Jesus Christ by putting your faith and your trust in him as the savior of your soul, I want to tell you something this morning. You are just as much a part of the crowd that was shouting for his death. The question we must consider today is this. Who is Jesus to you? Is he the miracle man? Is he just a great teacher with a unique message? Or is he the Lord of your life? The anger, the contempt, and the hatred of Jesus was so great. Watch this. That even once they beat him with a cat of nine tails and all of his flesh was hanging out of his back, the Bible says that his internal organs were exposed. So much of his flesh was hanging. I'm not trying to gore you or scare you or anything, but it was a horrific scene. The Bible even says that he was so beaten, he did not even look like a human being. Not only was he unrecognizable, he didn't even look human. The anger 
The hatred for him was so intense that while he's in that condition, they've got him nailed to a cross. The mocking still doesn't quit. People are walking by, looking at him, laughing at him, spitting on him, saying things like, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. This is God. If you're God, Jesus, then call down your angels and get off the cross. They would not stop even when he was in such a horrific place. He wasn't harming or saying anything. He did have a few words from the cross. But I'll tell you, remember the two guys on each side of him? Even they joined in with the crowd and started casting insults towards Christ. But I close with this. This is where we see one of the most amazing things happen. Jesus is there on the cross. The thieves and the people are casting insults. And then all of a sudden, you see, God can always take and work in any situation. One of those rotten criminals hanging there next to Jesus, suddenly, after hearing the words of Jesus, as Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He heard that, and the Spirit moved on his heart. And this thief, he didn't know anything about Jesus and religion and is all he knew was he was a criminal and he deserved to be where he was at. And he said this to the other thief. He said, Hey, you and I deserve to be here, but this man's done nothing. And then he looked to Jesus and he said, he said the only thing he knew to say, you ready? This is what he said. Would you remember me when you enter into your kingdom later today? guy didn't know what to say, but I'll tell you what, he, he demonstrated incredible faith because he demonstrated that he believed that Jesus was God simply by saying, when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and he said this. He didn't say, I'll remember you. Don't worry. I'll think of, I'll have good thoughts of you, my friend. We say that to a lot of people we see in need. Hey, I'll, I'll pray for you. I'll, I'll think about you. Now, you know what Jesus said? He said, today, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. It's the most awesome words ever heard. Let me tell you something, friends. I don't know what sin you brought in here. I don't know what your past is, but I know who does. And you know what? He's already paid for it. He's on trial in your heart today. The question is, what are you going to do with him? Will you say yes to Jesus? Or will you continue to say no? I don't want him to. The reason people say no, it's this simple. It's not that they don't like the idea of forgiveness. They don't like the idea of there being a Lord of their life. People say no to Christ because at least they're smart enough to know that if they say yes to him, he expects our lives to change. I'll tell you what, he does expect them to change. He'll give you the power to help change. And you know what? When you change, you'll be glad that you did. It's not like losing something. It's gaining something. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? The invitation is simple. First and foremost, I'm not asking if you're religious. I'm not asking if you go to church. I'm not asking if you know the Ten Commandments and can quote a hundred verses of Scripture. All of that is irrelevant if you do not have Jesus Christ on the throne of your life as the Lord and the Savior of your life. You can't ride to heaven on the coattails of grandma's faithfulness to church or your parents' faith in Jesus, you must decide for yourself that you want Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. Only you can do it. And here's how. You would pray a prayer like this. And these are not magic words. The Lord made you. You speak to him in the words you know, but just if you would like to receive the forgiveness of Christ this morning and know that you are a part of the forever family of God, 
pray a prayer something like this. You can pray it quietly in your own mind because the Lord knows our hearts. He knows our thoughts. Listen carefully. If you mean business with God, I want to ask you, pray this prayer this morning. Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I don't even know how much I've sinned against you, but I know you do. And I'm asking you today to forgive me of my sins. I'm inviting you, Lord, to come into my heart and life. Not just to save me, to spare me from my sin and from the penalty, but Lord, I'm asking you to be the Lord of my life. I want to live the rest of my life for you. I want my life to bring honor and glory to you. I know it's going to bring about change, but I'm welcoming that change. I receive you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer this morning, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, and nothing can take you out of his hand. You are forever, forever saved. That's the first part of the invitation. If you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to do something. Tell someone. In Romans chapter 10, Jesus said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that God raised him from the dead and thou shalt be saved. Confession is made with the mouth. Believe with your heart, but confess with your mouth. In other words, you need to speak of it. Being ashamed, then I don't think anything happened. I don't think you meant it. If you're excited about what the Lord did for you, tell the person you came with, tell me as you're walking out the door, I'll be here just now. We're fixing to sing and have an invitation. You come tell me right here. I just prayed to receive Jesus Christ. Is all I'm going to do is pray with you that God would encourage you and strengthen you to live the Christian life. Let's stand together. Maybe you're here and you're like, you know what? I am saved. But sometimes I'm like that crowd. When the pressure's on and the heat is on, sometimes I don't take that stand for the Lord that he's called me to take. You know what? You're like all of us. But that doesn't mean that we should just stand in our weakness and accept it. Here's my invitation to you. Would you just come get on your knees this morning, whatever the, the struggle, the battle is, and say, God, give me the strength to take a stand for you and for your kingdom. Would you come as we sing? Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of is white as snow Oh, the blood of Jesus Oh, the blood of Jesus Oh, the blood of Jesus it washes white as snow. There's power in the blood. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Let's lift up our voices in that chorus to the Lord this morning. Would you lead us in the chorus, Landon? Oh, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other found I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. Boy, y'all sound great. I love y'all so much. Thank you so much for being in God's house today. If you're our guest, please take that card by the connect table. Listen, grab those Easter invites because listen, I'm going to be depressed 
Y'all don't want me to be depressed, do you? I'm going to be depressed if I go out there after you're all gone and there's still like 200 cards laying out there. Those cards aren't going to help here. They need to be put in the hands of people. You use them to reach out to people this week. And listen, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, right here in the auditorium, we'll have a brief Bible study and a prayer meeting together where we actually come together in prayer. So we invite you to join with us on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. God bless you all.